Hi, this is Dr. McCullough, and today we're here with Dr. Paul Conniff, who is our honored guest and really is a, the, one of the true experts in the movement to oppose fluoridation. He's trained as a chemist and his specialty is environmental chemistry, and he's really known throughout the world as a leader in this movement because of his knowledge base. And he is full-time dedicated to this. He's a, a head of an organization called the Fluoride Action Network, or FAN. Dot net, I believe, mm -hmm. FAN.net. Yeah. And it really has compiled amazing information. But the purpose of our meeting today in our interview is to really give you some information that you may have not be been aware of before and then to actually provide some take home points that we can start to implement the process to remove fluoride from the water supply of the United States because the United States is only one of eight countries in the entire world, the entire developed world, that has more than 50% of their water supply fluoridated, if you can believe that. Most all of Europe is not fluoridated. Yeah, only if, uh, just uh, Ireland is fluoridated. Ireland, over uh, 50, uh, Ireland is the only country in Europe with over 50% of it fluoridated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Spain has a little bit of fluoridation. England is at 10%, it's been at 10% for years. So yeah, most of mainland Europe is not fluoridated and yet their teeth are just as good, if not better than ours. Yeah, so that's the challenge here. We have the United States supposedly, you know, the, one of the wisest scientific countries in the world, but yet we're still engaging this process, which is questionable at best, as you'll, I'm sure you'll reach that conclusion. So uh, that is really the, the sort of the central core, but we're hoping to get people interested and uh, committed to action efforts in, in, in three areas primarily. One is Canada, because only 40% of Canada is fluoridated and we believe with some effort, some strong effort, we have a lot of people viewing this who are uh, who live in Canada, that we can actually get Florida out of the entire country of Canada. And I think that's doable in the near future. Yeah, British Columbia and uh, Quebec are essentially non-fluoridated now. So it's really most of the fluoridation is concentrated in Alberta and Ontario. And if Ontario goes, Canada goes. Yeah, so that's a doable thing. And then the other two communities in the United States that we want to focus our efforts on because we've always, we've already have uh, leaders, leadership in this area and, and some of the media support, which is key to getting it removed from the community, is uh, San Diego, California, and Austin, Texas. Now, there may be some other communities that we're not aware of, and the purpose of this format in Vital Votes, you'll know below the comment here, there's an opportunity for you to participate. And if you're already registered, it's fine. You can just add your comment. If not, it's just a simple process to add it. And then let us know that you're interested in starting a movement in your local community and we can work together to collect that information and, and start the process rolling. But those are the three areas we're going to focus on. So if you, you know, if you already know about fluoride, most likely you're going to learn more because this is the world expert sitting next to me and that's, I'm just so delighted we we're, 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 uh, we're have the opportunity to work with you because we, uh, we get together regularly with our team mm -hmm. once a quarter and one of our highest priorities is to remove fluoride from the water supply. Yeah. So we're absolutely committed. We're working with him, uh, Paul, to do this. And, and it's an achievable goal. I really think we can yeah. do it. It's as easy to stop as turning off a tap. You know, yeah. right now we have this huge problem in the Gulf of Mexico trying to tap a, 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 a leaking oil well. I mean, everybody knows that. It's incredibly difficult. But fluoridation, if we had the political will, it's as easy to stop tomorrow as just turning off a tap. Yes. And, and you know, the the... The supposition, the theory as to why it was initially introduced seems beneficial. I mean, it's yeah. a public health benefit. Who would be, you'd have to be out of your mind to oppose reducing dental caries in kids. That's right. Harmlessness in children. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who could be opposed to that? Certainly we aren't, yeah. but the issue is let's, in, uh, let's provide an intervention that's actually going to achieve that yeah. rather than then support one that is not achieving that, but even worse, causing harm That's and right. damage. That's all right. That's so why, right. don't you, why don't you expand on that concept? Well, there are many arguments against fluoridation, of course. Number one, it's very bad medicine because once you put it in the water, you can't control the dose. You can't control who gets it. No one's, there's no oversight. You're allowing a, a community to do to everyone what a doctor can do to, to no one, force them to take medication. Secondly, it's... it's um, it's avoidable, it's unnecessary because they now, even the promoters of fluoridation concede that the major benefits are topical. It works from the outside of the tooth, not from inside of the body. So why swallow it? Why put it in the drinking water when you can brush your teeth with fluoridated toothpaste? And it's ineffective. 
There is practically no difference in tooth decay between fluoridated countries, which is the majority, and non-fluoridated countries. No difference in fluoridated states or, or states which have a high percentage of fluoridation and, and those which have because, low. Because it's an important tangent. There's a large number of communities within the United States currently yeah. that do not fluoridate their water. Is that yeah. correct? No, the, the majority fluoridate. The majority do, but there's a large number. Yeah, there's a large number that don't, and you right. can't tell the difference. If right. you look at them, you can't tell the difference between the communities of fluoridated and non-fluoridated. Um, and then, at the, uh, as you said, in addition to all of that, it's probably causing harm. We know that 32% of American children have been overexposed to fluoride because you have this telltale sign of dental fluorosis, which in its mildest form, little white specks, but when it gets more serious, it, the, the, it affects more of the surface of the teeth and it becomes colored, yellow, brown, orange, and, and so on, mottling of, of the teeth. 32% of American children are overexposed to fluoride. Well, their attitude, the promoters of fluoridation, say, well, oh, it's just a cosmetic effect. Is that, uh, it's a small price to pay for yeah. reducing your dental care. Exactly. Right. But uh, as we said, it, it is not reducing dental care by, by very much, if any. And at the same time, this is an indicator for somebody who's studied toxicology, environmental chemistry, as I've done. This is a, a worrying indicator that the body has been overexposed to fluoride. And it will be a biochemical miracle if fluoride that's damaging the growing tooth cells is not damaging something else in the child's body. For example, the, the bones, the teeth are the, the window to the bones. Have you seen the, you've seen the damage to the teeth? What damage can you not see? It's to, just to, to growing developmental trauma. Absolutely. 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 And now we have 23 studies, if you believe, from four different countries, uh, Brazil, um, Iran, India and China, which indicate that moderate exposure to fluoride is lowering IQ in children. And the levels, are the, the lowest level that they estimate that this is happening, 1.9 parts per million fluoride. Well, if you've got an effect, 1.9 parts per million with a few hundred children in the study, and I visited in the villages in China where that study was done, I, I, there's not enough margin of safety to protect every child that's being exposed to fluoride. You need a much larger margin of safety than that. And this, this, uh, this study here, this, um, this is the National Research Council. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, asked the National Research Council to do this study. It took them over two, two years to do 507 pages. And, and what's the National Research Council for those who aren't familiar it's, with it's it? A, it's part of the National Academies, uh, National Academies, yeah. And, and, and that's a private or is it a, is it, is it a, corp, is it a government It's institution? a private entity, but the government uses it a lot for, for mm -hmm. when they want a study with an it's independent, a, it's an independent objective. Ad, exactly. Okay. And this was one of the most balanced panels that's ever looked. So you're, at you're convinced that there was really no significant uh, members on the committee that had serious conflicts of interest as do so many of these other expert panels? No, in fact, it was the first time they ever had people on there that were publicly anti-fluoridation and people on there that were pro-fluoridation. Usually, it's usually they're all pro-fluoridation mm -hmm. uh, because it's an establishment uh, position. Mm -hmm. But um, no, they looked at it for two or three years and came back and said that the, the current uh, safe drinking water standard in the EPA is too high and it should be lowered. Uh, and after four years, the EPA has done, done nothing, practically no, published nothing. Yeah, so that's an interesting aspect. I mean, the government asked for a study objective, done, it was done and performed and showed that it, it real, the policy needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. and, and over four years later, nothing has happened. No, no, nothing has happened. So this is based on the government's own data. So and, and, and look at it. Basically, what you've got is you, you've got the CDC saying one part per million is good for children to drink to protect their teeth. And we have now the National Research Council saying that the safety standard of four parts per million is too high and needs to be lowered. Again, what margin of safety would you want to protect the whole population? 